Thank you, Morgan. Thank you all for, for attending. Um, before we get into the guts of the presentation here, I'm going to go over a quick overview of what we covered. Um, first, I'm going to cover the Midwest nitrate issue. Um, some nitrate removal practices that have been known to work. Um, the project overview of what I'm working on. Some saturated buffer sites. What denitrification actually is and how I'm going to tie, tie that into my project. And then how I'm going to be measuring denitrification. All right, so the Midwest nitrate issue. So without tile drainage, a lot of the Midwest lo would look like the picture on the left here. A lot of standing water, a lot of wetlands, basically a wet prairie. But however, over the last 100 plus years, we have tile drain and converted a lot of land to pattern tile drain land to look something like these neon green lines right here. So every 60 or so feet, we have another tile drainage pipe, and that essentially all leads out to a ditch, and a lot of the water leaves. Essentially, probably a little over now, 50 million acres of the Midwest is drained. Uh, there's more tile drainage going in every year, so this problem keeps increasing. Now, along with all that water leaving, we have a lot of nitrate leaching. So nitrogen is put on in the field in the form of ammonia. However, under aerobic conditions, that could be nitrified to nitrate, which is a very mobile ion, and then that's ultimately transported to the ditch and sent to the Gulf of Mexico, where it can cause hypoxic issues, which, Bill, you just pointed out. So some ways of removing this nitrate before it gets to the, the ditch includes both infield and edge of field practices. Some infield practices, practices include the four R's, which in, is the right source, right rate, right time, and right place. So it should be called the four rights, but it's called the four R's. Um, the use of nitrification inhibitors, use of slow release fertilizers, and cover crops. Now, a lot of those affect how farmers uh, manage their crop plan and can affect the, um, their overall timing of how they produce the crops. So some of them aren't necessarily um, favored to be um, established in the fields. So that's why they came up with edge of field practices, which are um, wetlands, bioreactors, drainage water management, as, and also a relatively new strategy called saturated buffers, which I will be talking to you guys about today. So project overview, what are my main questions? Well, the main question is, how well do saturated buffers remove nitrate from tile water, first, first and foremost? Secondly, um, how much of this nitrate is being removed through denitrification, so microbial denitrification? And then, how does microbial denitrification and saturated buffers vary both spatially as well as seasonally? So first, let's get into what a saturated buffer is. So on the left, we have a conventional buffer. We have the tile coming from the field, from the pattern drained um, corn and soybean field. And that tile just goes straight through the buffer and ultimately to the streamer ditch. There is no chance for this water to be processed and no chance for the nitrate to be removed. However, with saturated buffers, the tile goes into a distribution box, as you can see here. That distribution box controls the head pressure, which can send water out into this lateral pipe here that's installed. And all that water in the pipe is allowed to slowly seep to the stream. Now, What's so great about saturated buffers is that in heavy rain events, a lot of the overland or a lot of the um, overflow, sorry, um, can still reach the drainage ditch without holding um, any water back in the field. So we won't affect the farmer's production practices. So, so ultimately, we want the nitrate, most of the nitrate-enriched tile water, to seep slowly from this lateral pipe to the ditch and then being removed through vegetation uptake as well as microbial denitrification. So the two saturated buffer sites that we're looking at is, um, are just north of Ames. Uh, one is on Bear Creek, um, just 
north of the Hamilton Story County line here, which will be close to tomorrow. Um, and then the other one is on a tributary to the South Skunk Saturated Buffer, or uh, South Skunk River, and thus is called the South Skunk Saturated Buffer. So the Bear, the Bear Creek um, Buffer was established in 1995, and I've got two people that can tell me if I'm totally correct in that, that year. Um, so they were established in 1995, and, and so it's 20 years old. And the first eight meters, so from the corn field edge to the tree line here, is in switchgrass. The next six meters was um, a shrub grass um, zone. I say was because now the silver maple have kind of taken it over and it's kind of one big wooded um, area. And then the rest of the buffer, the rest of the six meters is in um, silver maple forest. So the saturation of this buffer started in 2010. The other site, the South Skunk site, um, the buffer was established in 2002, so it is 13 years old. It is in just switchgrass, so it's got 36 meters of switchgrass from the corn edge to um, the tributary right here. And the saturation um, started in 2012. So some data that was collected uh, for both sites here, um, this is the flow data. And we can see here that in years where there was less flow, so less water coming out of the field, um, over 50% of the total flow was diverted into the saturated buffer. The rest of it was overflow and went right to the stream. However, in wet years, like 2013, 2014, we see here that the Bear Creek, we only had 35 and 36% of the water diverted into the saturated buffer. So. so as far as nitrate reductions go, um, see here that um, in the dry years, there wasn't much nitrate coming into the buffer, so it was almost like nitrate limited. Um, we had a very, uh, a lower rate of nitrate removed. However, still over 100 kilograms of nitrate removed. And then 2013, um, right after the drought, um, I tell you there was a lot of nitrate that was leached, and we had a relatively high amount of nitrate removed, close to 300 kilograms of nitrogen. And then the South Skunk um, saturated buffer does drain a very small portion of land, I think three hectares. So it's um, only seen a little over 50 kilograms of N. So my study is looking at denitrification and how much of this nitrate is um, being removed through microbial denitrification. So just an overview of the nitrogen cycle here. Uh, my research focuses just on this, the right side of this graph here. So the process that goes from nitrate to nitrous oxide and hopefully all the way to um, dinitrogen gas which makes up 70, or, yeah, 78 percent of the atmosphere and is an inert gas. So how do we measure denitrification? What, what am I doing to um, get this overall rate? We're doing it two different ways. Um, the first way is through um, doing acetylene inhibition. So we're going to be taking, or we have taken soil cores with um, hydraulic Giddings probe down to about a meter dividing this meter um, core up into 20 centimeter chunks and saturating each of these cores with um, acetylene. So what acetylene does is that it stops this last process of denitrification so that all of the nitrate that's being denitrified will be captured as nitrous oxide, which we can measure. We can't measure um, dinitrogen gas as well because um, it's, like I said, 78% of the atmosphere and it's just too, it's too concentrated already. So um, it allows us to capture everything as um, nitrous oxide and I can therefore get an overall rate of denitrification over that incubation time. So these cores uh, will be taken, taken once per month and 
it would be done according to vegetation type. So four cores would be taken from the switchgrass area every month, and then four cores from the wooded area of the buffer. And they would be done randomly to account for spatial variation so that we don't, um, don't collect from one side, uh, one side of the buffer and get an um, inaccurate picture of what's going on. Now, with a South Skunk saturated buffer, uh, since it's all in switchgrass, only four cores per month will be collected. And um, once again, done randomly. The second method that we're going to be doing to measure denitrification is the push-pull method developed by um, Addy et al. And this method involves installing piezometers at three different depths at 0, 40, and 90 centimeters below the water table. When these piezometers are installed, we're going to be pushing a plume of enriched um, N N N15 labeled nitrate as well as other tracers into the ground, letting that incubate for a few hours, and then pumping it out and analyzing it for N15 labeled nitrate as well as um, nitrous oxide and um, regular nitrate and regular nitrous oxide. And over that time frame, we can determine um, how, what, what the magnitude of the denitrification rate is for that time. Um, these piezometer nests of these three depths will be done in various locations throughout the, the buffer, once again, done randomly, so we can assess the spatial variation. And this push-pull method will be done once per season, so once in the spring, once fall, once summer. And um, it will be done more if needed, and by if needed, if it's um, more random or more variable than what we thought originally. So, and once again, it will be done with respect to um, vegetation type. Now, I don't have any results from these two um, experiments yet because, well, first of all, the Giddings probe gave us some issues right away off the bat, and it was hard to take cores, but we officially have the cores now. And we f did our first um, successful piezometer pumping um, last week. So, all right. So some future work that I want to work on is um, obviously continue to collect cores and do piezometers to get these rates. That's first and foremost. Um, I'm also interested in looking at other um, terminal electron acceptors for microbes. So like sulfate, uh, manganese, and also carbon dioxide and see how they um, end up changing as water flows through the saturated buffer. And then compare all these results to our regular unsaturated buffer, so just the conventional buffer with a tile going right through it. So we already have some really well established unsaturated sites that um, we have um, over 10 years of data from and we can use them to compare what we're doing at these saturated sites. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the collaborators on this project, which include both um, people from Iowa State University and um, the USDA ARS. Uh, I also want to include the undergrad workers, which I did not list on here, but I'm very thankful for. Two of them are in the audience right here. Um, but there are many, so I can't list them all on one slide. Um, but thank you. And then obviously, funding support um, cannot have done this project or anything else without funding. So uh, I'd like to thank the USDA, um, the AFRI grant that we have, as well as McIntyre Stennis Cooperative Forestry Program and the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Thank you. We've got some time for some questions. Um, do you have someone? The concept of saturated buffer is just the hydrology of it. It's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have anyone who's actually measuring rates of water flow from those lateral pipes to the stream and mm -hmm. to get an idea of what the, what the spatial pattern is of, of water flow. Definitely. To me, that'd be important when telling you where to sample. Yeah. Sort of yep. And so the question is if I'm looking at um, the the spatial variation of hydrology, essentially. Um, 
Yes, uh, Dan Janes is um, our solar physicist on this project, and he has done some work already, but he's also going to be doing this bromide tracer test. And we have multiple transects of wells going through the buffer, so we're going to see how long it takes for that bromide to get to each well and each transect, so that'll help a lot with determining that, that flow path. Yes? Yeah, there's a little recanary grass in there too, and there's also some species that I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, although it's not done all that well, you can do the trafficking by the landowner. So there's uh, some Polaris air day seed, the canary grass, and also some Bromus enormous, the Bromus enormous. Um, 1995. Any other questions? I think that's.